Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, Season 2, Episode 5. Uh, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about multi-dog households. And um, Shannon and I were just having a conversation before we started the podcast. <laughs> and Shannon came up with a great way, big picture way, to think about this. And, and uh, maybe you can give us a quick summary of what we're going to talk about before we dive even deeper into this topic, Shannon. Yeah, you bet. We're going to talk about multi-dog households today and living in a peaceful multi-dog household. And I wrote an article and the article has four tools and two rules. So we decided that that was a really good intro for the article. So it has now been renamed Four Tools and Two Rules for Living in a Peaceful Multi-Dog Household. So if you're <laughs> listening to this podcast and you, uh, I'll leave a link to uh, Shannon's article in the show notes below. But when you get there, you'll be part of the group that's aware that this wasn't originally titled uh, Living uh, or, or Four Tools and Two Rules Uh You'll you'll be on the you'll be on the you'll be in the know, which the, is kind of cool. The creative process Absolutely. is what it is. <laughs> now, um, this this is a topic that uh, you know a lot of people may not have to worry about. Maybe they have a single dog household, and, and I'd say that's for most people that is the case. But if you're in a multi dog household, you know that there are a bunch of different challenges that you're faced with whether it's your adult dogs, your puppies, the training process. I mean, there's just so, so many things to think about. But what we really promote here at McCann Dogs is, you know, um, an efficient, safe, relatively quick way to build relationship with uh, all of your dogs. And we know the value. We I know we use that term pretty loosely, the word relationship. But, um, you know, we know that how much value there is into every individual dog getting some attention as well as building that bond with you that, that everyone, it, no different than children, that you have a unique relationship with each dog. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really important thing. A lot of the times what goes awry when you live in a multi-dog household is that the second dog that comes into the household, we forget how much work we put into the first one. We forget how much time we spent with that first dog as an individual. And we end up in a situation where now we have a second one. And a lot of the times we try to introduce that dog by just saying, okay, you know what, let's let him go and let him be loose with the other dog and let him have fun with the other dog. And that unfortunately leaves you on the sidelines. So it'll become harder and harder for the human in the relationship to bond with either of those dogs because they're getting so many of their needs met by each other and especially with a puppy. They already can identify so easily with other dogs because they've just come from a situation where mom and litter mates were there with them, you know, pretty much 24-7 probably. And now they're in a situation where the familiar thing, the most familiar thing, and the easiest thing for them to communicate with and learn from is that other dog in the household. So it's really important that we don't just allow that situation to occur if we want to be part of the equation as well. Like I really want to make sure when I bring a puppy home, that puppy bonds with me and learns all the rules of the house and whatnot from me. So, so, so important to go about it a little bit more systematically than just, uh, here you go, here's your new brother. <laughs> well, and how many times have you heard someone say like, well, you know, I just let the older dog kind of show him uh, whatever the skill is or the behavior. And that's leaving a lot to chance. And we don't, we don't believe in uh, leaving things to chance. You yeah. know, we, we want to make sure that the dog's getting good information from us first. Uh, so it's a really important thing to to, to know that uh, you are going to make better decisions for your dog than the other dog might. I know that there is some value in, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a social understanding and figuring out how to work, act, be around other dogs. But it's so vitally important that you're the one guiding that uh, that learning process. Absolutely. And not only is that going to be good for your relationship with the puppy, it's also going to be good for your relationship with the older dog. A, a lot of times older dogs, puppies come into the home and the older dog will either be like, yeah, rock and roll. I love having another dog around or they'll be a little bit put out. You know, especially if you have a dog that's sort of over the point of being a young, rambunctious, playing prime of their life type of dog. You know, if they're eight or nine, they might be really stressed out about having this sudden change in the home. And those of you who have recently had puppies will know that those teeth are little needles and puppies can be a lot. They can be a lot for us to deal with as humans. It's no different for our older dogs in the home. And the last thing we want to do is leave the older dog in the home to have the responsibility of putting the puppy in their place because some dogs will do it very, very nicely. Some dogs are, are very nuanced with it. They're lovely and wonderful. And other dogs, not so much. Other The dogs that 
that are extremely tolerant can often be the worst ones because they're tolerant until they're not. Yeah. And then they blow their stack and it's an overreaction instead of something that's nicely going to teach the pup. So as the humans in the home, you are so much better off to do all that heavy lifting. Protect your older dogs. And your older dog as well will thank you for that. It will aid your relationship with the older dog if you keep them from having to deal with the pesky, annoying puppy that is maybe putting them off. For sure. I I, I agree with this. I, I've, I've lived this. You know, when I first brought Deegan home, I often talk about the fact that I didn't come to McCann Dogs until Deegan was almost two years old and she was a, a, a compl- a, a, quite a mess, uh, quite a challenge uh, to, to work with. Um, but when I first brought her home, I made all of the wrong choices. I had a, I think she was maybe six year old, a six year old lab at home at that time um, who was very relaxed and wasn't that energetic. Uh, but Deegan, on the other hand, was a wild and crazy little thing from, from day one. And uh, I learned very quickly that uh, the older dog didn't want to have anything to do with her. And something else that I realized is the uh, my older dog at that time, Hurley, uh, she didn't get a choice whether I brought a dog home. She yeah. didn't get a say. So uh, it was my responsibility to make sure that, you know, she wasn't put out, put off uh, by this wild and crazy puppy because she just wasn't into it. Now, the other thing I didn't realize at that time was how important obedience is and you know, some people think about obedience as that formal heel at your side, but mm-hmm. obedience, I mean, boils down to just about every interaction you have with your dog. You have a point in your article that says, what's obedience got to do with it? And let's talk about why it's such an important factor. It makes me want to sing a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> what's obedience got to do? <laughs> exactly. You guys are lucky that Ken sang instead of me. He can carry it too much better. <laughs> All righty. So... When we bring home another dog in the household, it's so important to have some verbal control and some listening skills before we set them loose and sort of set them on a path to make their own choices. We talk about that quite a bit, and that's um, that's definitely our philosophy. We want to make sure that they learn the rules first rather than getting into trouble and then trying to backtrack from that. In the past 20 years, I've lived with a varying, I know you have as well, I lived with a varying number of dogs. I've lived with one, I've lived with two, I've lived with three, and I've lived with four. I've never gotten above four, which I'm happy about. Right now, I live with two. But there's a drastic difference in the way they interact. As you add more dogs, you get a lot more interaction and behavior that's more of a, a, a pack-like mentality. And we're not talking about, you know, the, the the pack theory that says that all dogs are dominant, etc. But they do work out ritual. They do work out hierarchies in the home. There's definitely some truth to where they sit in terms of their interactions. And it's really important for us to be able to have some say in that because not all dogs are capable of doing a good job in mediating that themselves. And in addition to that, not only is this sort of a, a foreign situation we're putting them into where we're having them come into our homes and live in, live with humans. We are doing so by containing their space a little bit. We're forcing them to share space. We're forcing them to share resources in a lot of cases. And that can sometimes bring up competition. There's all sorts of things that can happen. And if you're not able to recognize and address some of those things right away or shut down the energy that are, are, are bad energy that are uh, that will fuel things that are going to be negative in the relationship between the dogs, we end up in a situation where we might it might escalate into fights. It might become hostile between the dogs. So the earlier you can shut down things that are inappropriate, the better off you're going to be. And that requires obedience. It requires your dogs to be able to respond to a verbal cue. Because for example, if they're on the other side of the room and something starts to happen, you're recognizing body language that you think, oh, I don't like that. I want to shut that down. It's important to be able to get that on a verbal cue. If you have to take the time to go all the way over, it could escalate by the time you've gotten there. And also Mm -hmm. bringing your energy into the mix will really change the dynamic with the dogs as well. So as much as possible, you just want to remove one of the dogs from the situation, but you want to be able to do that with a verbal control. Mm -hmm. So obedience, first tool here. The first tool in the list, on the list is response to name. Being able to call your dog's name and get that instant response where they, they break away from what they're doing and just focus on you for a second and that gives you the opportunity to give them something else to do so you might then call them over to you you might say go to your bed and go lie down you know situations that sort of de-escalate the situation Uh, and I think you know as we talk about this I can kind of foresee what some of the questions might be if this were a YouTube video or uh, coming from a student this is when we talk about uh, some of these obedience skills specifically response to name 
this isn't something that we're going to test. You know, we're not going to put our dogs in this situation, two dogs together, and then test and see what the response to name is like. This is something we're going to start from the first day that uh, our new dog comes home. And, you know, oftentimes we'll say puppy, but uh, when if you don't have a puppy, you're bringing home an adult dog, I want you to think about their level of understanding. So uh, that response to name, we're practicing that. And also just something that sort of came to mind a little bit uh, outside of what we're talking about, but management outside of the time when we're training. And I don't know, Shannon, you might get a little bit deeper into that in mm-hmm. this article, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, how important that is so that you can set aside time to train these skills before you test them. Absolutely. So that puppy comes into the home. I always have my older dogs out of the picture until that young dog has some skills. So I will utilize baby gates in the house or I'll crate my older dogs. I'll give them something else to do. And then the puppy comes out and I do some work with the puppy. And that all goes towards building good skills. It also goes towards building relationship, building trick training, you know, all the things that I want my puppy to start to associate with me in terms of play. Those are the things that I'm going to be doing with my puppy. I don't want my puppy associating all those things with the older dog. I want him thinking I am the one that brings all the wonderful things in his life. So yeah. it, it set up for training and response to name is one of the things that we teach. And people are often really surprised that this is something that you have to teach. They just expect that, you know, like humans, we get assigned a name and then we come to learn that that's our name. With dogs, not only is the concept of a name completely foreign to them, but they don't understand that when they hear that word, it means focus on me for a second. Right. I've got other instructions for you. So we need to teach them that. It's it's just a simple process of saying this is the expectation when you hear this verbal sound. The expectation is that you turn towards me and then great things happen. So we spend a lot of time actually first loading up the name so that there's an association of focusing on us with the name and then teaching them to turn off of mild distractions, then heavier distractions, etc. When um, when we teach something like response to name, it is uh, we, we we really focus on motivation, and yeah. this is an exercise. Whether you have a puppy or a new dog in your household, that you can do uh, in, a, in two minutes, you can do several restrained response to name recalls, and it's going to burn some of that energy off. You know, you're sort of getting accomplishing two goals at the same time, where you're teaching a skill, but you're also tiring out your dog. Um, so take advantage for those of you who are listening to this, thinking like, how can I tire my puppy out? I don't really want to do obedience. I mean, these we have lots of uh, uh, videos on the ch- on our YouTube channel, probably a podcast that talks a little bit about motivation with a recall or something like that. But these exercises really accomplish so much. Absolutely. Especially in a multiple dog household. Oh, absolutely. You really want to have some way of getting their attention. But the response to name can be the funnest game that you play. We have all sorts of great YouTube videos, hide and seek videos with response to name training. You can have a blast with this. Don't think of it as staunch obedience. It's the fun stuff. Yeah. And and I hope that's something that um, anyone who's listened to this podcast, watched our YouTube videos, uh, maybe you're a student of ours. If you're a student of ours, you'll have have seen how how um, much fun training can be. Yeah. And that's really what I discovered here at McCann Dogs was how much fun training can be. But again, I also ended up with a dog who would love to listen. Yeah. You know how much fun it is for them. Um, so it really, really changes your perspective. Now, Absolutely. And even staunch obedience is lots of fun. I yeah. Like it, I mean, but yeah, it is fun. for sure. Yeah. It, I mean, I think you need to be of that mindset. You <laughs> need to, you know, have those very specific goals. But if you do, boy, is it awesome being uh, yeah. that critical of the sp- I don't know, specifics of staunch mm-hmm. obedience? It's the accuracy. accuracy and you know right, what? The yeah, partnership yeah. that you develop, and we won't get on to a, a big thing about obedience, but making something that is not innately rewarding whatsoever, really rewarding right. for the dog is so satisfying. Yeah. It yeah. really is. It's yeah. my favorite thing. Yeah. Now, w- w- some of the other skills, I, I know that one of the other skills that you mentioned uh, you need to be working on in your multi-dog household is a settle. Yes. Now, I would hazard a guess that uh, people have uh, used or tried to use the term settle in a lot of different ways uh, with their dogs. It's probably an overused uh, thought or maybe even something that they say. But how can someone teach a settle? What, why would they focus on teaching a settle in a multi-dog household? Oh, so nice to have an off switch for your dog. This is 
the butter. This is really the nice thing. So with Settle, I teach it with play. I teach my dog to initiate, or I initiate play rather. I teach them to play with me, have some fun, and then settle on command. And I will spend a lot of time with my young dogs just going through lots of repetition of this. First, I'll be down on my knees with them so I can interact as a young puppy, give them a little push away, have some fun. Then I'll tell them settle, just reach in, gently take the collar, and right away I'm going to feed them just for coming down in energy. Again, this is a young puppy. They don't know at this point anything that they're supposed to be doing, so I'm teaching. I'm showing him that the game can go high and then the game can come back down, and this is such a nice thing to create. This Mm -hmm. off switch, being able to just say settle and have the association be that this little wave of calmness comes over the puppy. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. It's worth its weight in gold. You, I use it a ton. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed the next one on your list is go to your place. And this mm-hmm. might be for some uh, people at home uh, on your bed, uh, but a really, really great exercise. And, and uh, I can totally see how it would be applicable in a multi-dog house. So we'll just talk about how you know go to your place might be used effectively. Yeah, you bet. And this could be a crate. It could be a bed. It could be a specific spot in the home. But basically, there's always a designated area. And wherever I am, there's always a de- designated area for each dog. And if I'm in my living room, as an example, there's one crate and there's two dog beds. Um, so there's always an option to have one dog in the crate or two dogs out in the bed or, or vice versa. Um, that didn't really make sense, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> My math skills are, uh, are getting tested. <laughs> so I always have, basically, I always have a, a, the ability to defuse the situation and get the dogs either out of my own space if I need to, or out of each other's spaces, just in a quick way. Uh, it also helps because if the doorbell rings, I have some place yeah. to send my dogs right away. And I've worked on teaching them how to do it regardless of what kind of excitement level there is. So through the teaching and the proofing, I've taught my dogs how to go to their bed, even if there's something really exciting going on, like there's a package being delivered. You know, I can send them to their beds instead of having them crowd the door. And those sorts of things are really important because when the energy starts to go up and you have multiple dogs coming into the same space, that energy being heightened can often create a little bit of tension. Sure. It depends on the dogs. I mean, some dogs are really, really stable and well-balanced, but other dogs can be a little bit higher, or a little bit lower, maybe a little bit uh, uncertain about other dogs being so close in their space, or they might be a little unsure about the delivery coming, the person coming to their house. All of these things will contribute to energy that might end up with this tight spatial situation sure. causing a little bit of an eruption. So yeah. if you can if you can avoid having that energy come into the the same space yeah. and be so intense, you're you're well on your way to avoiding any sort of scuffles. The utility of this skill is is uh, so amazing and I, I was just thinking a couple of nights ago when we had Euchre, uh, our puppy uh, at, at our house, she was out, I guess she's about 19 weeks now, um, but she was out and we we're going to sit down to dinner and you know if we can't manage her, we will ask her to go lie down on her bed and um, it was so remarkable because we've consistently either asked her to go lie down in her bed or at, there was a time when she needed a little bit more supervision, we just have her go in her crate and you know, we could see her and whatever, but she'd just chill out and chew on a bone. Well, the other night, we, Kale and I sat down for dinner and Euchre went to her little mat where we'd ask her to go oh, lie down good girl. Uh, and she just laid down. And, um, you know, it, it, it's so gratifying to see that sort of, uh, th- that start to happen. Yeah. But you also know that she finds it quite rewarding. You know, we don't, she doesn't, she doesn't have to be. And I know a lot of people think like, wow, geez, I don't want my dog to have to go in their crate so much, which I can give you a million reasons why it's nice to have a dog that wants to be in there. But um, if you want uh, your dog to be out while you eat dinner or while you watch a show on TV or whatever the thing is where you're distracted, if you can teach them to go lie on their bed, what a powerful skill. Also, uh, a really great leadership moment. Uh, and we talk a, a lot about leadership, not, uh, you know, heavy handed, uh, you know, uh, rules and iron fist leadership, but, uh, you know, uh, an understanding that you're worth listening to. Mm-hmm. A- another skill that you talk about in this, uh, in the four, uh, four rules is wait your turn. Mm-hmm. And I love, we, I use this all the time with, uh, we have six dogs at home, um, but let's talk about using that skill in a multi-dog household. Yeah, absolutely. This is so good for a lot of reasons, not just in a multi-dog household, but it is also so nice for creating emotional control with your dogs. Um, and it, I use this a lot when I'm training with my dogs, but I also use it in day-to-day life for manners. So as an example, wait your turn at the food bowl. I, I 
these are situations where if there's a potential for competition in the home, you could end up having little scuffles. So there's just, there's a nice ability to just drain out any sort of competition from the environment if you can have that emotional control with your dogs. So for example, mealtime, I will have both my dogs just automatically sit. As soon as I start preparing, anytime near four o'clock when I go to the kitchen, you will see two tollers come running in my direction and plant their butts on the ground in their spots because right. that is the eating ritual. Yeah. Even if it's 3.30, they think it's time to eat and that's what they're <laughs> doing. And they get very sad, of course, when I leave the kitchen without feeding them because it's not four o'clock yet. Right, right. But when I am ready to feed them and they're both sitting in their spots, you know, just like you, she figured out that it's valuable for her to go to her bed when you guys are eating dinner because yeah. chances are you have been training that really hard. You've been rewarding her for hanging out on her bed while you're having dinner and yeah. she's figured out that's the spot to be that's the golden golden spot where i get all my great things so same thing in the kitchen with the food bowl you know they figure out that i don't get that meal until i'm sitting in that spot so i'm going to be as good as gold and beat you to it and i'm going to sit here so that you can quickly feed me because i really want that that's what i want so the two dogs are sitting i'll put their food bowls down and they're not allowed to to leave to eat those excuse me, they're not allowed to break the sit to eat their meals until I've said their name. So in that situation, I will release them on their name. Okay, Ned. Okay, Reggie. And they know that those are their cues. Situations like going out the front door, as an example, you know, same idea. I don't want that front door and that excitement to be this place where all of this, you know, uh, too high energy culminates and there ends up being a little bit of a scuffle between the doors. And this is especially true if you have more than a couple of dogs, Mm -hmm. because like I've, like I said earlier, the pack behavior tends to escalate the more dogs that you have, you're going to see more of this and there'll be more opportunities for competition and whatnot. So just having them take their time, no, Knowing that they can't rush or barge through any of these things. Um, the other place that I use this a lot is when I am doing individual interactions with the dog. So if I'm grooming one dog, as an example, you know, the grooming place is a very, val- or the grooming table, pardon me, is a valuable place to be mm-hmm. because they get lots of reinforcement and attention when they're up there. Um, if I'm training in the home, I will have one dog lying down off to the side on their place usually, and they have to wait their turn while I'm training the other dog, but they know that their turn is coming up. So it's not a situation where there's competition that's fueled it, but I'm also not getting a, having a situation where I'm trying to work with one dog and the other one is butting in. So then the dog I'm working with gets frustrated because their time is being, you know, interrupted. So it can create some hostility and some frustration between the dogs if they're trying to compete for attention, especially. I, I think, um, I'm again, I'm thinking back to some of the exercises that we're doing currently with uh, our puppy, but I also, uh, you know, remember back when some of our older dogs now were puppies. And something like playing fetch or something we, – we'll start with an exercise like tug. We'll have the other dog there. We'll have the puppy. We'll ask her to go lie down. And this is something that you're going to work through when you're talking about waiting your turn. But um, it's a great opportunity to show your dog that if they exercise that self-restraint, that it's going to be worth it. And it's in such a controlled environment in uh, this example, I guess, that I'm speaking about right now. But it's just something, you know, as we talk more about these kinds of exercises and ideas. This is why, uh, you know, people say like, oh, you know, how, how do those dogs get trained so fast? Well, these are the kinds of exercises mm-hmm. that we incorporate into everyday life. We know that it's valuable. So we'll, we'll go out of our way to, to do these things. And something like wait your turn, whether it's playing a game, going out a door, getting your food bowl, every one of those teaches your dog that if they work just a little bit for you, even if, you know, they have, it means that they have to wait for that thing that they want so badly that they're going to get it. And, it, and, and in fact, it maybe it's better uh, uh, than they had expected with a game of tug or something like that that. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, these are such valuable tools, man. If I had heard this stuff before I, uh, <laughs> before I had to bring my dog to McCann dogs many years ago, I might not have, uh, uh you know, uh, uh, discovered the, 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 all of the amazing world of dog training. Yeah. Uh, but like, these are kind of the kinds of decisions that can really change everything. Now, uh, with that said, talking about our online training, uh, it's the reason that we're able to sit here and um, chat with you guys, you know, do our podcast. And uh, I wanted to 
give a little quick shout out to our life skills program. One of our life skills students who uh, sent us a uh, wonderful message. This is from Jan. And Jan said, I've told so many people about McCann dog training. I have an easy dog in Dobby as he is a bug, a pug a breed whose sole function is to read people and to please them. But the training made him an outstanding pet. Really, the program taught me how to train and how to problem solve when the training was stalled. If I lived near the school, uh, you would never get rid of me in person uh, <laughs> as the warm and friendly community of trainers has been amazing. In fact, it has uh, been a real bright spot of human contact during an otherwise bleak year. And uh, we want to thank you, Jan, for sending such a a lovely message. And uh, if you are listening today and you're interested in our life skills program for dogs over five months, I'll uh, drop a link in the show notes below. Now, we got to the four rule, four tools. Now we need to get to the two rules of, uh, of the multi-dog household. Let's talk about rule number one, Shannon. And is this, do you think this is the most important uh, yeah. one? Yeah, I really do. Um, there has to be boundaries. There has to be limitations. And this rule, you are never allowed to take an item from another dog, is probably number one on my list. I am the only one that's ever allowed to go in and take an item from a dog. The other dogs, if if they're on their bed chewing... They're off limits. They're completely safe. And this is something that I teach with my young puppies. You know, right away when there is a young puppy in the home, I will have opportunities where I have the old dog out to do something on the bed as an example. And I will be working with my young dog lying down on their own bed, feeding those cookies, sort of like what you set up uh, Euchre at the dinner table with, feeding those cookies. And then I will give my older dog something to occupy them so that it's there. It's a temptation. I will make sure that I have something for the puppy as well. So that might be the opportunity where I sit down with them and I let them chew on a bully stick. And, you know, this is um, this is a situation where it also builds trust and value for me being around when they're chewing something that is high value. So I will hold the bully stick and let them chew on it and we can interact. I can pet them. And I'm there to make sure that if that puppy says, oh, what's the older dog got over there? I can say, hey, you mind your own business. Here's your own. T- here's, your, here's your own bully stick. You can chew on this. And then I can reinforce those things as well. I also make sure that there is a leash or a line on the puppy at all times. Of course, if you're not new to McCann Dogs, you know that we believe in the house line wholeheartedly until they are 100% listening to our verbal cues so that we can always redirect behavior if need be. So I've got the leash on. So if my puppy decides that despite me saying, hey, you pay attention to this over here, he's still going to go and check out that other dog in the bone. He gets stopped right away. The problem with allowing, a lot of times people will think that if... The dog that's chewing the bone doesn't want to be bothered by the approaching dog. They will tell them off nicely. And that is a perfect world scenario. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time. So there's a lot of times where an older dog will decide that that's the time to possess. And all dogs are allowed to possess items. This is a natural rule in dogdom, and it's exactly why we spend time counter-conditioning that. We spend time saying, hey, you know what? I'm not a threat. When I come in to take something away from you, it's a good thing. We teach them how to take their guard down with that and not be worried about losing a valuable resource. But the other dogs don't do that. So there's definitely going to be a potential for conflict there, and that's the thing that we want to make sure that it's like trying to squeeze the tooth paste back into the tube once that competition is out in the air. Sure. So we want to make sure that as much as possible, we set the scene right off the bat and teach the dogs to leave each other alone when they've got resources. You're never allowed to bother another dog. Yeah. And I think everyone should be very mindful. Don't, don't, again, this is, we talk about training long before you try long before testing. So expect that your puppy is going to be interested or your young dog in training is going to be interested in that other dog and plan ahead for it. You know, have that reward or uh, j- just as, um, I don't know, inviting, enticing thing to, mm-hmm. to give to them. And, and it is it is training. You know, this isn't something that's just going to naturally sort itself out. I mean, it, it might, but we don't want to leave things to chance. Yeah. This is the second time we've mentioned that today. Exactly. And like I said, a lot of dogs that are very stable and they're, you know, very pack driven where they can read each other very well and they're fluid at wanting to be in a cooperative situation, you might not see any of these problems. But we know very well that we don't always have the benefit or the privilege of that stability. So we want to make sure that we set some rules. And even if it is there, it's just a nicer existence if we know that there's not going to be a scuffle. Well, and if you have a dog that's a bit of a bully, do you want to encourage that behavior? Do you want to show your dog that this is a great opportunity? 
are big and tough and you can get what you want by yeah. you know being growly. Do you really want your dog out in the in the real world uh, around other dogs acting that way? Yeah. I wouldn't think so. And again, it could be the story of that really tolerant dog. So if you if you're constantly allowing waiting for that dog to get to the point where he says I've had it, I'm done with this young punk trying to take my bully stick all yeah. the time, yeah. he might get to the point where it's an overreaction at the end because he's been tolerant, tolerant, tolerant until he's not. So, yeah. And we don't want to put them in that position. You know, we want them to know, I've got your back. I'm going to make sure that your bully stick doesn't get stolen on you, bud. You're good. <laughs> Rule number two, you talk about no competing with each other for resources. And that's a little bit different than mm -hmm. what we have just been uh, discussing. Let's talk about that. Yeah. And this really goes back to having that tool of wait your turn, having the emotional control to not barge right in. And my Reggie, uh, everybody who's seen Reggie, he's he's just a sweet, lovable guy. But he is actually one of the pushiest dogs that I have ever owned. He is pushier than my Rottweiler was. And, you know, my other tollers, by comparison, I... I I would say none of them were ever anywhere near as pushy, but he's a really pushy guy. So I've had to be very conscious his whole life because he will barge right in. You know, he's the dog where if I open the fridge, he'll fly right into the fridge to see what he can grab in a hurry. So I've had to really instill manners in him so that his default nature of just being rammy and running into whatever he loves because he's that, you know, high, excited energy. And in his brain, he's entitled to everything that he wants because he's the cutest thing. Right. So I have to keep that in check with him. So he's the dog that I have worked really hard on things like sitting outside the kitchen, you know, not coming in the kitchen unless he's invited. Things like that are really important with Reggie because if he's given an inch, he will absolutely be the one to take a mile. So uh, just sorry, just to interrupt yeah. really quickly for you, that was, it was at an arbitrary line. I'm sure, you know, people at home might be thinking like, <laughs> well, why the kitchen specifically? Yeah. I mean, just because of the food thing, uh, Reggie is my walking stomach. He, I, he, I describe him as a walking stomach. His reason for existing is food. If he thinks he hears a crumb drop, he's completely stone deaf these days, but I swear to God, God, he still hears crumbs drop. <laughs> <laughs> so he is, um, is so powerfully motivated by food that I really need to make sure that those manners are in place and he's respectful of them. And, and you know, as an example with this, if Ned had food and Reggie saw that Ned had food and I hadn't done so much work with Reggie, Reggie would rush right in without thinking about anything other than I want that food. And that, of course, would cause hostility in the home. So uh, no competing for resources. You're not not allowed to try to steal things from the other dogs. You're not allowed to try to push the other dogs out of the way for, you know, food, attention, whatever, any of the resources in the home that are valuable to that dog. Reggie would in a heartbeat just body check one of the other dogs out of the way if he thought, I want to go and get pet by mom. Right. <laughs> so he needs to know that you have to be mannerly to approach for petting, etc. And if there's already a dog there being pet, you got to wait your turn. If you're a brand new multi-dog owner, uh, it's a difficult thing to say, but if if this is your first time having multiple dogs in your household, you you sh you need to know that it isn't always the biggest dog or the certain breed that will be the bully or or will be a little bit uh, overly confident in these situations. In fact, at home in our household, Hippie Shake, our toy poodle, I mean, we have Border Collies, <laughs> Black Lab, we have you know she, mixed breed pounds? dogs. Yeah, tiny little <laughs> thing, but she, you know she will definitely uh, you know work her way in and just take a bone away if we were to allow that to happen. Take a bone away from like grandson. Slam, who's I think he's a nine-year-old border collie, uh, big dog. Um, but uh, so, so it's not necessarily the breed. It's not you. You, you need to sort of um, give every. You need to be fair yeah. uh, to to both of your dogs or all of your dogs. But um, if if you've had multiple dogs in the past and you've probably seen this happen, you've probably recognized that uh, that uh, each dog is is uh, is a little bit different, and it's not always the one you'd expect who's going to be the. Uh, the resource uh, gatherer. Absolutely. Well, and interestingly enough, we were talking about seeing different levels of pack behavior based on how many dogs you have. And with Reggie aging right now, he's just turned 13 uh, last week, two weeks ago, something like that. Fairly recently, we celebrated a birthday. And uh, at this point, starting to slow down a little bit. He's still got all the drive in the world, but just for less amount of time now. But I'm noticing things as as our lives have changed, you know, due to COVID and whatnot. I'm spending more time at home. I'm working from home a lot more. So we're doing neighborhood walks and, you know, we're, we're, not, um, we're not on 20 acres at home. So I'm throwing a lot of toys in the backyard on quick breaks and whatnot. So I'm starting to notice changes with Reggie where he is starting to sort of acquiesce more to Ned and say, right. okay, you know what? 
I'm getting a little bit older and I'm a little bit slower and I may be worried about getting body checked by you. Ned has 20 pounds on Reggie, which yeah. is just unbelievable. Quite the size difference between the two. And I'm noticing things like when they're bringing toys back in the yard, uh, Reggie will sort of stay off to the side and wait for Ned to come in and get his throne before he brings it in. So there's, um, if you can keep things nice and light with them, they're really good at the peaceful transition of power when they get to that point. So much better I, than you. I humans. couldn't agree more. <laughs> I, you know, I, I really like this point. Uh, I, we see it in our household. I see it in, uh, with our dogs. I can think of a few specific examples of even, uh, you know, friends dogs who were really close with would always go for walks with and one dog might be the one that just burns around everybody, runs really quickly and then rad or border collie, uh, you know, we got years ago. Um, he was just the, 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 the little guy and would stick close to us and then we saw him start to mature and the, the older dog sort of started to fall back and then rad became the one mm-hmm. that would uh, round us all up. But um, identifying that and that I, I, I love the, um, that the natural transition yes. of, you know, of power, so to speak, yeah. uh, is, uh, is a natural thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but leading up to that point and to ensure that it is, re- you know, a Something that uh, that can happen in your home without incident, you need to be a referee. You need to be a yeah. great teacher yeah. uh, for your dogs. Absolutely. If you can keep it from escalating all through the dog's lives, if you can keep things on a nice level playing field, it's a really easy transition. I want to thank you guys for listening to this show. I hope you feel a little bit more confident about uh, dealing with your multi-dog household prepared. Maybe you are a single dog owner who's about to get a, another dog. Uh, I hope this has given you a little bit of insight and uh, some strategies to make sure that uh, that your household is as uh, peaceful as it was before you brought another dog home. And uh, th- Shannon, I want to thank you for for uh, joining me today for the podcast. Pleasure. On that note, guys, happy training. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training.